Our next speaker has been providing consultancy to financial advisors since 1996 uh, in areas including regulation, technology and mergers and acquisitions. He helped launch 360, uh, a business support service for advisors, and has recently launched Zero, where he advises board members on strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Phil Young. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, for the af afternoon session. A full day on MIFID 2. Congratulations on, on making it back as well. Um, I'm, I'm conscious, first of all, that I mean, not only have you, you got a full day of MIFID 2 stuff anyway, but there's also been other people on talking about it. You've had somebody from the FCA. So, I mean, I guess you know everything that there is to know about MIFID 2, having had the regulator in to explain it all anyway. Um, and I'm also conscious that there's a number of different people in the room from different backgrounds. Just for my own benefit, with a show of hands, how many people here today are actually advising clients? And how many people are from a compliance background? And how many people are something other than that? Board members, directors, non-advising, etc. Fine. So what I've tried to do is, is put together a, a presentation that will hopefully suit everybody, which are really about um, my experience over... Since September, I've been on the road doing presentations to advisors predominantly or business owners of advisory businesses about MIFID II. And I've been collecting... Uh, and building up a series of the main moans and groans that people have had about MIFID II over the past few months or so. So this is kind of intended to be a little bit more practical and hands-on. If you're an advisor, you might well recognise some of these issues along the way. If you're a compliance person with advisors that's got to deliver the message, then it's useful to know what the problems are going to crop up and, and, and sort of think about how to, how to deal with those issues. And even if you're a a DFM or an asset manager and you've got advisors who are effectively the clients of yours that you need to be talking to, then hopefully this will give you an idea of what the problems that they're facing. Some of the areas that you can maybe add a little bit of help um, along the way. Uh, I've got information about how different platforms are dealing with things as well. So what we'll do is we'll break about halfway through, deal with a few questions at that point in time and then deal with a few questions at the end if we've got time as well. So I've, I've basically, as a, as a child of the 1980s, um, I've kind of decided to resurrect Top of the Pops for it. There's no reason for it. I spent far too long looking for the images to go with this presentation, far longer than I did practicing it, as you're about to find out tragically as well. Um, so I'm going to go through the top, top 10, but I'm going to start off with the things that have fallen out of the chart, first of all. Sad, sadly, the Jammu, one of the few bands that I kind of like and recognize that we'll go through on here for it. So first of all, you might be surprised with some of these things. Independence is one of the, one of the uh, definitions that's changed in this part of MIFID. There's been very little publicity about this, uh, considering the amount of hype that you normally get in the press about independent versus restrictory, et cetera, et cetera. Most advisors that I've talked to have just greeted this with a bit of a shrug of the shoulders. For those of you who aren't aware, the definition is basically changing to, to the requirement, if you're independent, to, to basically consider a sufficient range of products, both in terms of the type and also the, um, uh, the providers that are involved in it to remain independent. There's a, the, the slight nuance to it is, is that it, it allows a few more people out there that are currently restricted, that decided around RDR to go restricted um, because they didn't want to get involved in advising on VCT, certain retail investment products <coughs> in particular that you thought, can't be bothered with it, don't want to do the CPD, don't want to even consider it as on an investment committee or anything like that. You, generally, it was larger firms, maybe 20 advisors, where the burden of overseeing that was a bit too much for them. Some of them weren't restricted, not a huge number. Most of those guys, some of them now, there's a bit of wriggle room where they could actually go back to being independent. None of them can be bothered, to be honest with you. So having gone round all the clients five years ago to explain why they're moving from independent to restricted and it doesn't make a damn bit of difference, don't worry about it, it's not important, none of them are, are likely to go back to the clients and say, by the way, we're operating exactly the same way as we were doing before, but the rules have changed slightly, so now we can change it to being independent. So as a result, there are a few niche providers out there, um, particularly people that are providing pure at-retirement solutions. If you think about the old annuity gurus of the, de of, the, of the past, if you like, and people offering slightly more rounded solutions nowadays, annuity bureaus for obvious reasons aren't, um, aren't really the big thing anymore. But people offering those sorts of services that are quite niche aren't considering all retail investment products, but are offering um, a whole of market, if you like, uh, review and analysis of the market within the, within the um, 
within the product suite that do need to deliver those client outcomes, they could call themselves independent going further forward. No one really cares, if I'm honest with you. No one's really batted an eyelid at any of this sort of stuff. Next one, suitability review and um, the whole recommendation being the main change for advisors in there. If you look at the actual um, the paperwork on MIFID 2, uh, all several thousand pages of it, if you want to um, send yourself to sleep one evening, the, um, there is a lot of reference to, to changes to suitability. For most advisors out there, whether you're restricted or independent, it will come as a surprise to you to find out that a lot of this stuff was guidance beforehand and is now just being enshrined as a rule. Um, you probably didn't know that. The FCA probably didn't care. Um, and again, to, fight, to discover that you now need to consider the client's attitude to risk capacity for loss, all those sorts of things, is going to be no shock to anybody out there. Decent advisors are already doing this already. Um, and it's just a conversion of a lot of, the, um, a, a lot of the guidance that's been issued in the past into rules. One of the things that does come through, and I'll touch on this later on because it affects um, execution-only businesses, particularly robo-advice businesses, more light-touch advice businesses, is there is a requirement to do an annual review and an annual refresher of suitability. Again, if you're an advisory business, you're probably doing an annual, annual review on your client and getting through all that sort of stuff in any case. So again, it's not really proven to be much of a concern for most people. There's the odd firm out there that I've spoken to that say, actually, I've got a few clients where I review their circumstances once every two years as opposed to once every year and that needs a bit more thought applying to it but that, that's pretty rare <coughs> the one issue that does crop up um, and again that we've advised advisors they, they don't seem to be overly concerned about it but it just needs a little bit more documentation is the whole recommendation so as part of that suitability review if the answer is you don't need to do anything mr client I'm, I'm telling you just to stay put in the funds that you're in at the moment the fund is fine we don't need to switch this one out that's something that needs documented and privately the FCA have confirmed uh, by emails that I've seen um, that they expect that to be included in the suitability report as well, which was a little bit unclear and a little bit vague. Certainly it, would be, it needs to be in your investment committee. Um, so you would review it as part of all of that. Um, the, the advice that, that's been given is if it's a, you know, if it's a hold, then include the reference to the fact that, you've, uh, yeah, that, that fund remains suitable in the suitability report as well. It doesn't need to be war and peace. You're probably doing the thinking on all of that anyway. It just needs documenting, and most advisors perhaps aren't documenting that as thoroughly as they are for a, for a buy or a sell recommendation. Authorizations and passporting. Again, most advisors are, are either, either in or out of MIFID already at the moment. This is really going to affect a lot of firms that are actually looking to, to acquire passporting permissions. Like It's more information, more paperwork, it's harder to set up a new branch overseas and it's harder to, to shut one down. That's, again, not something that's worrying most advisory businesses out there. So it's pretty low down on the list of concerns that they've got. Um, it might affect some of the other people in the room a lot more. We'll go into the top 10 now. And at the end, by the way, I'm going to ask if you can, if you can guess which year all of these, because it's all from the same year. So if you can pick which year it was um, that these all came from. Best ex execution, not, not hugely high on the list, um, but it's something that I've flagged up to firms. Uh, this is another classic example of something that most firms should have been doing already. Uh, MIFID 2 includes quite a lot of information that's just a mop-up and a sweep-up exercise of things that people should have been doing that the FCA have already issued guidance on that a lot of people haven't really got around to. So best execution, the rules have changed um, from all reasonable to all sufficient steps in the detail of the rule. Um, I'm, I'm going to let lawyers, I'm, I'm told that that's a far higher threshold uh, for anybody dealing with best execution. I've got absolutely no idea why that would be the case, to be honest with you. So again, I, that's not, not something that I don't think any, anyone's going to be particularly bothered about. But advisors ha have frequently missed the fact that they have some responsibility for best execution above and beyond the platform. Most platforms will have a best execution policy. Advisors need to have one as well purely because they're selecting which platform to place a trade on in the first place. So they are part of that overall decision-making process. Um, and as a result, they have some best execution um, obligations. What that needs to include, I think, is something that can very easily be built into your annual platform diligence anyway. So in terms of diligence, if you, know, if you are a platform or if advisors are asking you about, platform, uh, about best execution policies, what they need to consider are issues like price, cost, speed, the likelihood of settlement, so their experience of how quickly 
um, uh, things do get settled. And also the size and the nature of the deal, any other con relevant considerations to, to that particular trade. And not only that, but if there's different types of transaction, if you take, for example, placing uh, buying and selling funds, is very different usually from buying and selling shares. So you'd need to have a best execution policy and a completely different set of research and diligence for different platforms where there's a material difference in the type of uh, type of product that's being bought and sold along the way. Now that sort of information can be very easily just be built in and into an extension of, of the platform diligence that most advisors do. I just find that most of them don't tend to have it documented to that level of detail. There's something about overall costs, but it doesn't go into quite that level of detail. If you think about um, issues, I'm not sure whether it cro crops up anymore, but if the if the product itself isn't necessarily on the platform, so to speak, so that the, um, that the trading times might be T plus one or T plus two business days, those are the sorts of things and the level of detail that I think advisors need to be, need to be getting into um, to, to make an assessment around the best execution. Most people have left the platform themselves to deal with that. They need to be picking up on that themselves. So that's come as a bit of a surprise to a few people out there, a few grunts and groans about it around the room, but basically it's a bit more effort on the platform diligence um, and, a, and a bit more detail that needs to go in there. I think some of the research providers out there, for example, could easily pick up on some of that stuff because it's, it's hard facts, a lot of it, that could easily be added into pretty generic research that's provided. Next, next big moan, number nine on the list, is inducements. There's not a huge amount in the inducements rules that will come as a, a big surprise to most people. It's kind of, uh, to my mind, having read them, it's a, it's, it's a slight hardening of the existing position that we're in at the moment. There's a set of eight tests um, that you need to pass. Virtually all of those tests make reference to there being some client benefit out of the, out, coming out of, the, out of the back of it. Whatever it is, is there any client benefit that comes out from it? The, um, there's an acceptance that training can be provided for free. And that's pretty much the only thing that they actually name in a positive way that you can do. So training can be offered um, by a provider, by a fund manager, whoever, to an advisor. But the training involved needs to be something of value to the end consumer. So it needs to be, needs to upskill the advisor's technical knowledge, et cetera, wh whatever it is that may be in there. In terms of the actual, th there's an acceptance in there that you do need food and water possibly caffeine if it's a MIFID 2 presentation, to get through some training if it's a full day. So that's, that's factored into that. But it does use the ominous words, uh, the value of that must be de minimis value hospitality. Now, I don't know, and people have asked me, said, what, what's de minimis value hospitality? So I'm like, I don't know exactly, but it is not on a yacht. Um, <laughs> It's not, it doesn't sound very exciting, does it? It, it doesn't sound like uh, anyone's having a great deal of fun with it. So having some lunch, having a drink or whatever, um, refreshment seems to be absolutely fine for it. Anything above and beyond that is gonna be tough. <coughs> I'd ask the questions with, the, um, with those eight tests, whether they are eight tests or four plus four. So if you don't pass the first four, then there's a bit of a carve out and a bit of wriggle room for the second one, which it appears that there is. Um, so there's bound to be a bit of fun and great games around what can be done, what can't be done. The one thing that I've seen, and this is from quite a way back, uh, a question that was asked, and the FCA came up with what I think is the wrong answer, because uh, it could have been a little bit more helpful on this particular one, but, uh, but they weren't. So I've not seen them say this in public at all, and it might be that somebody um, said, you know, came up with, a, with an answer that, that, that wasn't as well thought out as it could have been. Um, but the question that was posed to them was, is it allowable for an advisor to take a professional introducer, for example, out to, to, to entertain them, some hospitality, to an event, out for some drinks, theatre, whatever it may be. Now, the FCA thought that that was an inducement and would breach the rules. Um, I saw a statement from the CISI, which was, which I kind of agree with if that was the, <coughs> the, I think that was the sentiment behind it as well. I think that's a nonsense because what on earth is going to go wrong? If you think about what, what the, the downside consequences of that as an inducement could, could be, I can't think of any because you're not trying to steer them into any particular product. Into any, the, worst, the only thing that's going to happen is that somebody's going to get more advice as a result of more introductions, introductions coming across. So I actually think that's a little bit daft. I don't know whether it would breach accountancy rules, you know, if it's a lawyer, whether it would be, be in breach of their rules as well. We all know that there's, there's de minimis, you know, there's certain values in there that you can't, 
uh, can't be breaching, it can't be anything excessive. But it does seem to me that that's a bit of a, an over the top clamp down in, in certain areas uh, that, could, that the FCA could easily have said, we don't see the problem with that because what's, what are you actually bribing someone to do to give, to give you more business, to give you advice? If you're actually selling the product to them and all you had was one product to sell, I could see how that would actually potentially be an inducement for them. But that's something to, to keep an eye on whether or not, because within the, within the rules it, it didn't specify that, so people have asked the FCA and that's, that's, the, uh, that's the conclusion, unfortunately, they've come up with on it. Number eight is, uh, is taping. Most of the moans that I've had from advisors have been the sheer volume of cold calls that they've had from people who offer audio recording software uh, and insisting that they, I mean, the, the, the latest one I picked up on is um, BT have been ringing, ringing up financial advisors and saying, can we help you with your MIFID 2 requirements? And you think, which be this British Telecom are cold calling people about MIFID 2. Um, <coughs> I doubt that they're going through much above and beyond audio recording. Um, if you're a MIFID firm or if you um, exempt CAD, you don't have any option. You're going to have to record. You're going to have to tape calls. I don't know anybody that's actually taped anything since the 1980s either, uh, to be honest with you, but you're going to have to record calls. But the only things that you need to record are occasions where there's actually um, a contract that's concluded, which I guess a, a lot of you will have been through this whole process and looked at this already. If you're an exempt, Article 3 exempt firm, which most advisors are out there, there's no record requirement to record whatsoever. And you can use um, the recording device, uh, which is fairly old-fashioned, called a biro, and a piece of pen, uh, and, and a, sorry, a piece of paper. All that you actually need to record as a result of that is, and I shall list them out, the date and time of the call, uh, who initiated it, um, and who was on the call, uh, and any re relevant information about the order, and any, any other information that might be required as well. So that's going to be recorded in a contemporaneous way, but it's basically just good, good file notes that you need to keep. A lot of advisors get a, a kicking from compliance over the years for not keeping good file notes, so there is a bit of a, a concern there. But really, this is just sweeping up those sorts of problems that should have they should have fixed and addressed along the way. Recording those file notes a month later or a fortnight afterwards isn't acceptable, by the way. Um, so it just does need to, to, to be um, to be contemporaneous or as soon as possible after the call is concluded. There has been a few people that flagged up to me and said, what about GDPR? Um, so I'm, I'm currently in the midst of looking, plowing through all the GDPR stuff. I, I don't think that's going to be an issue longer term for it. I think that the two things aren't going to clash as much as a few people are speculating at the moment. Um, so fundamentally, taping seems to be something that slipped right down the agenda. There was a load of um, noise about it a few months back. Uh, since the policy statement came out, they've watered it down for Article 3 exempt firms. That seems to have gone away as well. Number seven, conflicts of interest. Um, this, this has caused a bit of a stink, um, largely because most advisors think that they're disclosing conflicts of interest adequately, and I don't, and, I don't, and the FCA don't, and most people that have looked at it from the outside, I think, don't think that it's being disclosed uh, adequately. Um, the way in which I think culturally, the, the trap that we've fallen into as a profession and as an industry is that disclosing a conflict of interest and putting it in a client agreement somewhere is, is adequate. Um, and the paper very clearly states um, that that's not the same as, as managing it and it isn't the same as managing it. So again, it's another example where MIFID 2 and, and the paperwork is really reinforcing what advisors should be doing in the first place, I think, which is not just disclosing what the conflict of interest is, but first of all, considering whether they need to accept it in the first place. You know, we've, been, we've got, I think, far too used to the saying, there's a conflict of interest yet, yeah, we'll accept it and we'll stick it in a, in a client agreement or a suitability letter or as, a, and disclose it in some way. What you need to do is, one, first of all, decide whether you need to accept it. You know, conflicts of interest should be a last resort, and that's one of the phrases that's used in the paper as well. Decide whether you need to accept it in the first place. Once you've decided, if, if the answer is yes, you need to accept it, then think about all the possible downside consequences to your client in particular that could arise from that conflict of interest. So the example that I've used is a uh, managing director of, a, of an advice business um, wants to hand across 
um, business and introduced business to a DFN and his wife's the managing director of the of the DFN business. So I think we can all look at it. it it's not, there's no sort of shares exchange in hands. There's not kind of like hard disclosure in, in that way that would be fairly obvious to do. But I think everybody could see that there's a clear conflict of interest. You know, that couple are going to benefit one way or another from, from the introductions. So what's the downside? What are the consequences? What are the, what are the negative implications for a client? Well, fairly obviously, it could mean that you, that firm is introducing clients to that DFN, even though the costs are too high or the service is poor, just because the managing director and his wife benefits from that relationship financially one way or another. So once you've assessed what the, the downside risk could be, then you're explaining what the mitigants are so that you could mitigate it by you know, bringing in third party res research for it. Uh, you can employ an, an independent consultant to come and sit in on the investment committee and make sure that the decision is the right one. It may well be, that, and this should be the only reason that you've accepted that conflict in the first place, that you want to introduce the business because you think it's going to be the right thing for your clients. But there's a need to accept that there's, there's neg possible negative consequences, even if they're further down the line, and understand what the mitigants are. All of that stuff, all of that content needs to go in a register and it needs to be signed off and reviewed on an annual basis by the senior management, by the board essentially. And again, most people are sticking it in a client agreement and disclosing it that way, but they aren't really critiquing it enough. Uh, it's not written in a conflicts register and it's not reviewed on an annual basis to, to make sure whether it's still relevant, needs updating, etc. at that point in time. And there are a lot more conflicts of interest than anybody realises flying around most businesses. Uh, the reason why people don't realise it is they, they don't tend to get written down. They're not, they're not thought through particularly carefully. Next one, and I, I really struggled to work out who the hell Andy Cameron was. Anybody know? Anybody remember? Yes? Right. That, that, that explains. That, uh, that explains the, um, the racist, stereotypical headgear that he's got on there for it. There you go. No, that, that's all right. Fine, we're okay. Um, dealing on personal account, loads of you here will be used to this, creating a record of, of dealing on personal account. If you've got shares um, and you do your own share deals, I'm guessing a lot of people here today looking at the sort of size of the firms involved, you, you'll, you'll have to fill them on a register somewhere. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, advisors have never, never done this before. Um, and MIFID 2 sweeps them under the same rules as everybody else. And a few business owners in particular have gone absolutely spare at this one, even though it seems really trivial. Um, so they're basically going to be required, as, as the, most of the rest of the industry, every bank, building society, platform provider fund manager is already doing this um, but they're, they're going to be required to keep a keep a register of all the uh, individual shares that advisors um, senior compliance people para planners etc anybody that's that's relevant that's going to get swept up in this uh, have now you've got it's a classic example of this being actually quite a trivial thing to do on paper but the emotional response to this was probably greater than any other thing that I've gone through with most advisors for it, partly because either they've got their own um, their own shares, it, it, they're concerned about exposing how much money they've got in shares um, to other members of staff, or because they've got 20 advisors, a lot of whom like doing their own little share dabble and they view it as an administrative nightmare. As I've tried to point out to them, no one's asking you to sign off on people's share trades or anything like that for it, but it just needs to be recorded. So again, if you're dealing with advisors on a day-to-day -day basis, they might have this as an issue. You, you, you've got a process in place. It'd be a great thing to just to talk to advisors to say, this is how you actually deal with it and how we manage it. It's not that big a deal. This is how we deal with the whole thing internally for it as well. Classic example of, of just a really big emotional reaction to something that seems relatively minor and relatively trivial. I'll do one more and then we'll, we'll stop if there's any questions along the way. Um, this is, this is, legal aid to the identifiers is the new rock and roll world. This is where it's at the moment. There's, there's been quite a lot of chaos and confusion around it. Um, I, I, I think it's relatively simple in some respects. I'm not talking about the regulatory reporting, which most advisors, by the way, don't have to do any reporting. So it's really just a question around whether or not they need to, to buy 
a legal entity identifier. I was surprised in September about how many people had actually got their heads around this in the first place. So I thought this would be the number one top. I have to spend 115 quid plus VAT on, a, on this. I'm quitting the industry sort of moment. As I've had plenty of those over the past 20 years or so. But I mean, the, the rules, by the way, that um, yeah, effectively, if you're going to if you if if you're going to buy or sell um, a reportable instrument, and reportable <laughs> instruments, the list that I've got: ETFs, warrants, gilts, investment trust shares, corporate bonds, VCTs, and structured products. Most people miss, in terms of platform providers, miss VCTs and structured products off the list because they aren't necessarily in the platform. That's caused a little bit of confusion um, because advisors have forgotten about that. They've been been getting the information from platforms which has been summarizing which which possible ones there are on their own platform and, and it's not been done that some platforms uh, james hay or mutual wealth for example don't have any reportable instruments on it so again the confusion has been i'm being told this by one platform and not by another two platforms raymond james and novia i believe have written out to all advisors to say you've all got to have a um an lei regardless of whether you need one or they've just said every, every single firm that uses our platform has got to have an LEI. And then the, the, the majority of platforms somewhere in the middle saying, if you're going to trade in one of these, then you're going to need one. And that's, that's caused a little bit of angst and a little bit of frustration along the way for us as well. So most people are going to end up buying one, I think, over the way, uh, along the way, um, just in case as much as anything else. From what I'm told that people have done it, it's taken anywhere from between a couple of days to a week to get it back. There's a bit of email bouncing backwards and forwards. So again, encouraging people to get on with it and do it, I think is the main priority. Um, this is all going to be done by the 3rd of January, uh, if you're going to buy one. In my head, because it makes it more entertaining for me, there's just one person at the London Stock Exchange dealing with all the emails coming through. It is a, it's a slightly more manual process than you'd think if you haven't been through the process on the grounds that you can, you can buy it online but there is somebody that will eyeball it and send you an email and ask you for an organization chart and stuff like that. Where it gets really messy is where you've got a more complex organization with different holding companies and different trading entities within the group um, to try and work out who needs an LEI and who doesn't. The, the bit that's caused the most confusion for people is whether or not um, corporate entities, corporate clients, charities and trusts need one, which they do as well um, along the same rules. So. If you, if, so for SASIs, for example, um, most SASIs are going to need um, an LEI, their own LEI to be added on there as well. The, the, there are two completely contradictory emails that I've seen um, from, the, from the FCA on this particular matter. I think it's been clarified now, um, but there has been a bit of confusion behind the scenes about, and, and some of that, I think, is to do with how the question was phrased and it was asked in the first place on it. But I've seen conflicting guidance as to whether charities, trusts and um, corporate clients need an LEI as well. But fundamentally, it's down to a platform to make that decision. And I think most of the platforms are speaking as one where they say, yeah, you do, um, because there's reports, if there's reportable instruments that they're going to actually trade in. Yeah. Yes, if you're going to trade in any of those reportable instruments that are referred to. So if you're going to place a trade, buy or sell it on a platform, then you're going to need your own LEI. What will happen is if you don't have one, um, you'll be asked for one and you won't be able to place that trade until you've got it. So even if you think that you might need one, but you don't know when, because you, you advise generally on those or you think you will do, your best bet is to get one because it, it will hold up a trade for the amount of time it takes for you to get an LEI. And as I say at the moment, some people have told me it's taken them a couple of days. Uh, some, somebody told me it took them a week to get it. It's just down to the resources at the other end of it. If you, if you think you're going to need one on the 3rd of January, I'd get one now, yeah, if in doubt. The, the, the FCA's line on it as well is that basically this is all about financial crime. So this is data that all gets thrown in to an XML message that washes around the system. Financial crime is not something that's ever going away. So if anything, it's going to, you get, there's, there's, you know, if you had to take a bet on it, there's probably going to be more of a need for you to have your own LEI than less of a need to have it over the years. The other thing that's going to, that, that needs to go into that XML message is a, a national identifier as well. 
So national identifier, if you're UK based, is gonna be your national insurance number. So that's a client's national insurance number. If it's a non-UK resident, there's, a, there's an equivalent proxy that'll be picked, you know, their own security number or passport number or something like that. Now those platforms that are already capturing that or product providers that are already capturing that may well have all of that data recorded. But I've just warned advisors to say, if you're being asked to submit a national insurance number um, to, to a platform or a provider when you haven't had to submit it before, it's just because of financial reporting. So don't worry about it. It's just that they don't hold it. Once you've added it in once, including your own LEI, then the system should actually store it, keep it, and you don't have to keep adding it um, thereafter. I think that's the way in which most of the platforms seem to be trying to build the system to, to capture it. So you enter it once and that's it done. Yep. I don't think a bear trust would need its own LEI. If the ultimately it's the platform's decision on it. Um, Bad trust don't need one. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I can't give you a, a, a definitive on that that one, but I, I, that that would be my instant reaction to it. But at the same time, you've got two platforms that are saying everybody needs an LEI for everything all the time. And that's what's driven people a little bit mad as opposed to uh, anything else that, like that on it. But fun fundamentally, it's down to a platform to decide, are we happy to do the transaction reporting? So they do have a degree of authority over that decision that needs to be made. If you look at Raymond James as an example, of, you know, fundamentally most people using that platform probably have discretionary permissions. And so I, so I think there's a specific reason that you could also look at it and say, you know, they, they're in a position where they could look at client portfolios and say, virtually everybody using our platform, because of the type of platform it is, is using an ETF or using something like that. So it makes sense just to, just to tr deal with it and treat it in that way. <coughs> it's just the messaging because advisors are obviously using multiple platforms and look at it and go, why am I, why am I being given different messages? But I think there's actually some logic that sits behind the scenes on it that, that not everybody can see. Whether there is on that one or not, I don't know. We'll, we'll get into the top five then. Well, four. With Rod Stewart. <laughs> um, I've mentioned about suitability reviews already being pretty low down on everyone's priority list or concerns. The one thing that loads of people haven't picked up on is there's a subtle change around suitability reports and when they've got to be issued. So it's, it's purely a timing issue around it. Um, the wording within the in the, in the regulation, um, it, what it is at the moment is it says you've got to issue a suitability report as soon as practical after the con contract's concluded. That's changed under MIFID 2 to before the contract's concluded. So I've had people say to me, Phil, what about the cancellation period? And you think, like, it's at the client's risk if the units go up or down during that. It's pretty difficult to argue that the contract's not concluded at that point in time. So I think this is a classic example of, of something that lots of people won't have picked up on. I've spoken to, I spoke to one outsource, uh, Richard Allen, um, who runs a, an outsource power planning business. He told me that 95% of his clients um, and the reports that are written uh, go out pre-advice um, anyway. So they basically go out, sign, it, sign the client up to it. They're not issued after the fact. I know for a fact that loads of advisors out there, however, don't do it in that way. I, in my experience, <coughs> where platforms are used, and we know that platforms are used you know, roughly 80% of the time, um, people tend to be issuing a report and, and getting clients to sign something as, as part of that deal because there isn't an application form in a traditional sense to do it. So I think for platform business, this will be easier to implement than for old fashioned products that are, that are still recommended out there. So products that get recommended I still find an awful lot of suitability reports go out after the fact and everyone's going to have to work out a way of, of re-engineering this and advisors are going to moan about it and compliance people are going to get flack for it. The, the one thing that, the one advice that I gave the last person that asked me about it is to say just blame it on the EU. Um, you know, you've got an opportunity. He, as a compliance person, had an issue in that he spends a lot of his time constantly chasing down advisors around the timing of, of getting those reports out the door. 
it's given him the opportunity to actually say, right, there's a new set of rules now. We've got to get them all done before the contract goes out the door. So that isn't going to factor hopefully next year on his uh, on his compliance report in terms of measuring the time scales and stuff because it's a it's a binary decision at that point in time. So it's a habit to get into, but it will frustrate a lot of people. This is another one which the FCA did a, a, a really good paper, I think, on it um, a few years ago. It's probably about four years ago, uh, which was all about the way in which um, advisors and sales staff were remunerated uh, and some of the incentive uh, packages that were given to them. It was focused a lot on um, some of the bad practices that went on in bank branches and building society branches, etc., where there were monthly targets on specific products, etc. People were heavily incentivized to, to flog a particular product uh, over the phone or whatever on a particular month. Um, but it applies to advisors as well. And in my experience, most people haven't done a damn thing about it. Um, it's now enshrined in the rules in the MIFID that effectively, when you're actually constructing a remuneration package for either senior managers or for advisors, there needs to be qualitative, not just quantitative steps and, and measurements that go into that remuneration package. There needs to be things like uh, the right balance between fixed and variable pay as well. Um, and it, all of this needs to be reviewed and signed off by senior management on, a, on an annual basis. You know, a, a remuneration committee, even if it's a, a small business, um, it needs to be properly looked at and assessed to see if there's any, any, un, any undue bias that's placed um, on advisors to steer business in a particular direction. Now, at the time, the FCA were relatively relaxed about this for most smaller IFA firms because the, the focus of attention was these short-term targets around particular products in banks and building society branches. However, um, some larger firms have now got through all of this and adopted it and, and changed the remuneration uh, package. I tend to expect to see, from, from my perspective, at least a 20% of the, the overall uh, bonus pot and target uh, being on a discretionary basis with some behavioural measurements in there as well around sort of compliant type behaviour and things like that that go in there. Most business owners that I talk to go absolutely nuts at the suggestion of that because they want hard targets that are based around entirely around sales figures or the amount of profit that they make. Um, so this is this I find dealing sitting on boards as I do a lot. This is probably the toughest thing that I have to deal with, particularly if it's people that are sat on a board that are out from outside of financial services experience because they're just not used to any of this sort of stuff at all. And it feels like I'm trying to take money off them when I, when I suggest that this is what the sort of thing that we've got to do. So it's in the rules now, it's in MIFID 2. I'll bet that most of you don't have advisors with those sorts of um, clauses, if you like, or disincentives built into the packages. So it can be an incentive for positive, for good behaviour. Um, if, it's, if, if, you, if the advisors are self-employed and they effectively are kind of buying services from the centre, if you like, the only way to, to, to deal with that is have a disin disincentive, as a few firms have done, by saying you're going to have to pay more if your compliance behaviour is poor and it means we have to put you on a higher rating, we have to review more files, then there's a higher split that gets paid away or a fixed fee that gets paid away to us for it. So that, that's something that's ne no one's really done so far um, because it's a difficult conversation and, and a lot of people are worried and nervous about upsetting their own advisors. It will come as a, a huge surprise to you, I'm sure, but a lot of the, um, a lot of the worst advisors from a compliance point of view are the biggest revenue earners in some cases and business owners are in a lot of cases terrified of, of upsetting them. Um, so there's quite a lot of emotion built up behind this particular issue. Again, it, it slid under the radar as far as MIFID's concerned, uh, but, it, but when I talk to advisors about it on a practical level, uh, people start to get a bit nervous about it. Number two, because th this has slipped down on the chart from number one, actually, um, partly because the, the FCA have actually come up with something mind-blowingly um, simple and you know, a, a great piece of common sense on this. When I was out in September, they hadn't really clarified any of this at all. So the, the argument I put forward was in the, in the, in the word in, in MIFID 2, in the paper that they sent out, the policy statement, it basically said that you had to disclose all of the costs and charges, the aggregated costs and charges, which includes 
um, financial instrument charges as well as your own advice or any discretionary management fees before any service is commenced. Now, if you take that very literally, uh, and the FCA are great at saying, you know, when you ask them difficult questions at times, well, it's up to you to interpret that. You know, that in, they're in black and white. It basically says before, if you're in, if you're an IFA or use uh, you know, an independent advisor as an example, um, you've got to disclose before any services commence, which is in theory before you provide any services. You've got to disclose your own fees and charges, fair enough. You've also got to disclose the platform that you're going to use, the funds that you're going to put the client in, and any discretionary services that you're going to recommend. And you're not, you're not supposed to have been decided any of those in advance of going through the whole fact find and making a decision anyway. So it's kind of a bit of a nonsense, uh, which I've been flagging up for a while. The two, option, the two alternatives were to either require more illustrative examples to go in the, um, in the client agreement along the way. Um, so I've, I've seen the FCA as part of the thematic review on suitability complement a few firms that had said in the client agreement and the upfront literature, here's our own costs and fees and charges, and here's some examples of how that will look. But also, here's an idea as to our, you know, we tend, we, we tend to use model portfolios. Here's an example of the fees and costs for, for that particular one, um, you know, for the middle one or the most popular one, just to give people a flavor of what to expect. Or we, we use these two platforms most commonly. Here's roughly what they would cost for it, so here's what you can expect. I, I still personally feel a little bit uncomfortable about that, uh, partly because I've seen some firms do it, and I've also seen them um, on, on the other side of the fence uh, get the wrist slapped for shoe running clients at the same time. Um, where the FCA have got to now, that, and that this is something that was announced at, um, at an event in October, um, they've said basically we don't expect that to appear anywhere until the suitability report if you're an independent firm, which I think is a good approach. And you kind of go, this is kind of back to where we were in the first place. So what you will need to do is enhance, if you're an IFA firm, you'll need to enhance the disclosure of your own fees and charges to include more of that information in your client agreement and to give more of an indication around illustrative charges that could be incurred further down the line, including ad hoc ones and one-offs and things like that. If you're charging just a, a 0.75 or a 1% or whatever, and that includes everything, uh, then arguably that makes life a lot simpler um, to dis disclose those sorts of things. Um, and then when it gets to the suitability report, you'll be required to do the aggregation and to disclose it. So at least you'll know at that point in time, hopefully, what the, what the total costs are like, likely to be. One of the issues around um, finding that kind of information, that kind of data, um, is factored into the, the changing rules for PRIPs that comes in, in January next year as well. One of the things to bear in mind, if you weren't aware, is that the PRIPs rules will facilitate the provision of all the relevant information to go into that aggregated cost and charge and, and the disclosure of it all at a relatively granular detail. However, UCITS funds aren't included in PRIPs until the end of the year. So there's also an acceptance with the FCA where they have said, and how formally they will give this guidance, I don't know, but informally they've said, look, if you're doing as much as you can in 2018 uh, to get as much information as you can, if you're showing willing on it, if there are occasions where you just can't possibly get <laughs> that information um, to the nth degree, then that they're reasonably comfortable that, that and the, they're understanding the fact that not everything's going to be perfect as of the 3rd of January 2018. So the main issue in there seems to be the, uh, the PRIPS rules and the application to UCITS funds where that's not scheduled to come through until the end of the year. The rest of the information should be there. Uh, the platforms, all the information that I've had back from platforms has been that they're going to facilitate most of this sort of stuff um, and that they'll include most of the aggregation in their own illustrations. So the fact that you can, you're going to generate the illustration, you're then going to write the suitability report out after you've generated that illustration will help enormously in that, that whole disclosure. It's still going to be a complete mess because it's not going to aggregate everything that you're advising a client on right across the board, uh, but at least some of the information will be there and available for you. That, that's miles better than where we could have got to. So something to be grateful for the FCA for on this occasion. <laughs> number one, anyone who wants to guess what number one is? Or who the band or, or artist is? That's more entertaining generally. Sorry? No. 
that uh, interesting. That's where advisors again. It, it's just not been a major issue for for most advisors that I've spoken to about that side of it. I think it will come. It it will come into play, uh, but probably a little bit further down the line when that starts to, to kick in a little bit. The the number one that sends everybody nuts is the 10% rule. <laughs> and, and specifically, and I know it doesn't just apply for model portfolios, but if you're an advisor and you outsource all the stuff to a DFM on a traditional bespoke tripartite agreement basis, nobody could care less because it's somebody else's problem to deal with it. The reason why this, I mean, there's a load of reasons why the 10% rule is just ridiculous. Um, and I'm not gonna get into all of those. I could rant about this, this one all day. Um, the reason why it's a particular concern for advisors when I've flagged it up to them is if you're, if, if you're buying in uh, a model portfolio service from, from, um, from a discretionary manager, as lots and lots of people are doing nowadays, the discretionary manager has the liability for the 10% uh, notification to go out, as mad as that 10% notification is. The platform is the custodian, so has the data. So the, the platform is the only one really that knows. And, and I'm, I'm, there's no advisor out there that I know that has a back office system that's accurate enough to, to be able to do this on the day that it happens. Um, and the advisor is the person with the, the relationship with the agency, with the, with the end client. So effectively, the only way that I can see this one panning out is for the DFMs to basically put um, the responsibility for the disclosure of the 10% um, drop in portfolios onto the advisor's obligations as part of that agency agreement. And as I've pointed out with putting my advisor hat on, um, if I'm an advisor, the DFM is potentially a big firm. If, if a bunch of people out there don't do it, or if I don't do it as an advisor, DFMs are a lot more finable than uh, by the FCA if the FCA did decide that they wanted to fine anybody on this, uh, then an advisory firm is. So that could be a big, it could be a big fine. Now, plenty of people have said to me, oh, the FCA aren't really bothered about this anyway. I'm like, yeah, we'll wait, wait and see in five years time when this actually happens, whether it's the same people that are saying that whether they're even around to say they're not bothered about it. So there's, there's, there's liability that's involved in, in this that's, that's gonna end up switching hands, I think, along the way. Um, the, the, the DFM can't discharge it. The only person really that can discharge this liability is the platform who isn't really privy to any of this contract um, or the advisor who is privy to the contracts. So what's happening at the moment um, from what I'm seeing is the technology is being built and a messaging system to let for, on the platforms to let the advisors know that the portfolio has dropped by 10%. Here's a batch file, Here, you, know, you need to send seems to be an acceptance that the advisor by and large is going to get the responsibility for shipping that information out. Um, what I haven't seen yet, which I'm sure is coming, is all the agency agreements being changed and advisors being told, by the way, you're on the hook for this as well as all the other stuff. I think most advisors are, are expecting that because I've been going around this country telling them this is how I think it's going to pan out. Uh, but I expect that to be a bit of a, a kickback on it. I've seen some advisors who don't like MPS say, this is the end for MPS, it's all over, which I don't think is going to happen. I've seen some people say, but it's really unlikely to ever happen. Um, anyway, so, so what? Uh, now, the fact that it's unlikely to happen makes me actually more nervous because the time when it, because it, what, what I can guarantee is it definitely will happen at some point in time. If you're not ready for it, uh, that's going to cause a problem. Um, Graham Bentley, I don't know if you know Graham, um, he was asked a question um, a couple of days ago, and, and being a bit of a nerd as he is, um, went and looked at the information on this. So it, he kind of checked back to from 1962, using basically the FTSE 100 all share as a sort of proxy for this. Um, how many times has this actually happened? Now, all, we, all that he's got is a rolling quarter, so I know that's not quite the same as the fixed quarters that we're dealing with here. On a rolling quarter basis, um, it's happened one, uh, just over 1,200 times since 1962, just over 1,000 since 1965. 
So he, he reckons, based on that, with the number of periods that he's measured, which is about 14,000 odd, got the exact numbers if you want them. Um, he said he reckons on a, on a, every, on a business day basis, there is a 7% chance of that actually happening, which I think is quite a high percentage, to be honest with you. Um, it's not quite as dramatic, I don't think, as a 7%, because that's on a rolling basis. One of the reasons why this is a particularly nuts rule is it's not on a rolling quarter basis. It's on a fixed quarter basis. So in theory, your portfolio could go down by 9.5% on the 31st of December and 9.5% on the 1st of January. And nobody needs to know about it. That's all fine. Look away. Not a problem. So that, that's basically um, the, the thing that's causing a bit of angst out there. On a practical level, there's not a huge amount that advisors are having to do about it. But I do think that once the liability starts to be swept up in the um, in the agreements and the agency agreements, that's where some people start to think a little bit long and hard about it. So if you're running a an NPS solution, because they've been hugely, hugely popular, just be aware that this is something that you might get a bit pushed back on. If it's me acting on behalf of an advisor, as I do from time to time, or sitting advising boards, what I'm saying to them is, go and cap that liability because you're allowed to cap the liability with another. You can't cap your liability with an end consumer. So if you're a DFM running it, you can't, you know, you can't necessarily do that. But on a business to business level, you could actually cap that liability. And I think that would be a, a, a much more palatable solution. I don't think advisors can avoid this liability, but I think that would be a more palatable solution for them in a longer way. What that cap is, is up to you guys to, to work out. The, um, just to finish off, if you're a robo-advisor, uh, for digital, it's slightly different as well. Uh, there's a, a few extra things that are in there that will be tough. I, I did a, an article in uh, Money Marketing this week on this one for it. So th there's an extended TMC regime that's got to cover um, help desk staff if they're actually giving guidance services. So some of you, if you're offering guidance services, you're going to need to extend your TMC regime to do, to do that. You don't have to have a specific exam for it or qualification so you, you, you know, unless one really suits for it. The annual suitability review I mentioned earlier on is going to be tough for some firms that are offering a real light touch robo type approach to it. So they're going to have to build some kind of comms in there as well. And product governance is going to be important for these guys. You, 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 what you're required to do is check that the products that people are buying um, are, are still relevant for the actual target. Uh, the, the people that are buying them that you were originally targeting them for are still the people that are actually buying it. So, and you need to keep recalibrating it. So it's almost a marketing and a data exercise, I think, uh, to cover this part of it off. Uh, and you'll end up with a, a different type of committee that might be a bit more interesting than your average investment committee in some respects where there's some marketing input into it as well to say, that's great that you designed all of this, but here's the people that are buying it, and how can we tweak it and make it better? Or, or we're surprised that these people are buying this and we didn't think that was going to happen, so maybe we need to put some more warnings in there as well. Because you've got the, the data and the MI in the robo business, that makes it a lot more possible to do it. Just to finish off, um, there's a guide that I did which is on the um, Nucleus Illuminate website. It's, it's pitched really at financial advisors and planners and, and mainly Article 3 exempt firms, but I've, I've written it as a kind of board level summary without getting into too much horrific detail along the way with a few action points and plans along the way. So if you want to download it, it's at the, uh, that's the, the longer website address at the bottom. I think we've got... Uh, dealt with all the questions hopefully along the way and I've all already overrun my time for it so uh, I'll finish there. Thank you very Thanks. much Phil.